appreciate being here and be, being given to, to have the opportunity to speak today. Um, how many of you can remember the last 45 record that you bought? A couple of you? All right, there's a few people here that probably never bought a 45 record. And through, uh, through my parents moving away, and uh, giving me boxes of all my old records and albums and their stuff, I found the last 45 record that I bought. And I've always kind of liked vinyl. And I have to tell you that there's a point, as you get older, I think, at least for me, there is this kind of internal movie loop that runs about what I was like as a kid. And as I've gotten older, it's gotten improved. So, so the, the image of myself and, and what, you know, what I was really like is very different from the loop that's rolling <laughs> at all times. So I got this and, and there's something special about the 45s and, and albums. At any rate, this is the last 45 record that I bought in 1986. Now the first thing that feeds that internal loop that I have is it's a Motown record. Now how cool is that? Mm -hmm. Remember the old logo? You don't see that anymore. I mean that's awesome. And you know you can look under the T and that's like where Toledo is. I mean this growing up and seeing these meant a lot to me. So when I went back and I said wow this is awesome. The last 45 record I bought was a Motown. How cool is that? Now this is where that internal movie part breaks down. <laughs> Because in 1986, the last 45 vinyl record that I purchased from Motown was done, was, was a song called Respect Yourself by Bruce Willis, <laughs> the actor. <laughs> He's not known for his music uh, talent, but apparently in 1986, I was moved where I went to the record store and purchased this. And, uh, and I still have it, and I listen to it. But anyway, I think the, um, I think the, uh, one of the things that was important as I went through these things, I sat down with my son, Matthew, and we started to go through all these old records, and I dragged him to a, 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 a vintage record store. Now, there's a few of them around. If, you, if you're looking for vintage records, there's still a few of them around. I don't think we have any owners of any vintage record stores here or employees. Good, because when you walk into a vintage record store, the people that work there, you would think, belong in a vintage record store. <laughs> so I dragged my son there, and he looked, you know, so we walked in, and the guy behind the counter gives you this kind of knowing look, like we knew you'd be back someday. Yeah. So we go through, buy some records, I get back in the car, and we're driving. And he's like, Dad, I know you've been listening to records, you have a turntable, I get that, but I, I don't get it. So you grab these records, and you drove to your friend's house, and you, you put it on a turntable. Yeah. And the hissing and the popping, not like a cockroach, <laughs> but yeah, that was part of what made it really cool. But you can only take that music as far as the extension cord could go. And you can't leave your records out in your car because we know what happens. They melt. They warp. He's like, do you realize that I have, and you can only listen to one artist at a time. And you have to change, if you want to skip a song, you have to get up and move the arm. He's like, Dad, and he pulls his iPod out. He said, I have 2,800 songs here. I can sort them by genre. I can make up playlists. I can repeat them. I can advance them. I can fast forward them. I'm going to go to the park and run. And I'm going to have my record collection with me. And it really dawned on me that all the things that I felt were important to me growing up and thought were important to my friends, to my son, to the youth today, they don't relate to that. Vintage is old. And, and it really got me thinking about how this once going to the malls and going to the three different or four different record stores in the malls, remember that? Harmony House, Boogie Records here locally, gone. And, it, and it, it made me think about what this means to us and the implications. Now, 1965 Mustang, and that's a classic car. And it, it really represents what Detroit, when it was at its very best. And Detroit, we, we live in the shadow of Detroit. 
in Toledo. We're kind of like the little brother of Detroit. And, the, you know, and if you go visit Detroit, it's the, the Red Wings, it's the Tigers, it's Motown, it's Marvin Gaye, Smokey Robinson, Fox Theater, all these things that mean so much to that city. It's the home of the big three. Organized labor started there. There were fist fights in the street. It's the hardest working city in the, in the world. But Detroit became famous for something else recently, and that was for going bankrupt. And the big three, I think, had a lot to do with that, obviously. When this car rolled off the lot, or rolled off the, the factory in Dearborn, the big three, according to Wards Automotive, said or they had 90% of the US market share in cars. It's remarkable. Nine out of 10 cars were American made. Today, that number is less than 45%. So that's startling. And, and it begs the question. I think Detroit, along the way, forgot what one of the founding fathers had to say about the automotive industry. Because the same company that brought you the Mustang of the 60s brought you the Pintos of the 70s. So, so this is something that you have to ask, well, what happened to the big three? Did they become lazy? Did they take their customers for granted? Did they just kind of phone it in? Because ultimately, they became bankrupt too. And, and so, so when we begin to look at these two things that touch all of our lives in so many different ways, and how they change so rapidly during our lifetime. As an educator, you have to say, well, what, what, does, what do vinyl records and muscle cars have to do with, with education? And I would argue everything. So John Dewey was one of the great innovators in, in, education thought, in educational theory and thought. And one of the things that he said is up here on the screen. But I want to do a pop quiz, because after all, I'm still a teacher at heart. How many of you went to school and began the school year in August or early September? Show of hands. All right. How many of you got out of school in late May or early June? All right. How many of you went to school, had six, seven, or eight classes a day? How many of you had teachers that stood in front of the classroom while you were in rows and delivered instruction through lecturing, writing on the chalkboard, blackboard? All right, you get the idea. That was the high school model in 1915 when John Dewey said what? Don't do that. So here we are today, 2014, doing exactly what he said not to do. So why do we do that? Why do we do that? I'm going to talk a little bit about why we shouldn't do that. This is kind of going back to that era that, that has passed us by a little bit. And I'm going to talk about my dad for a moment. He tells a story about on a Monday, he began a job with General Motors. Worked two days, didn't like it, quit. Two days later, he's working for Ford Motor Company, where he worked for more than 30 years and then retired. Both of my grandfathers worked their whole career, their whole adult life, in just three different companies between the two of them. And that's remarkable when you begin to say that, because 65% of the elementary students that we're teaching today across town here are going to be working in jobs, according to MacArthur Foundation, working in jobs that don't exist. So when Tim Marzullo is talking about the kinds of things that is getting him excited and talking about students and the kind of opportunities that are going to be existing in that field alone are limitless. There's going to be career opportunities for our students in elementary school today working in that field. We don't know what it's going to look like, but it's going to happen. And that's very surprising. By the time today, the US Department of Labor estimates that by the time students today 
reach the age of 38, they will have between 10 and 14 different jobs. Between my dad and my grandparents, I think they had five between all of their lives. So the model that we had in past generations when, when you know, we talked about John Dewey, the system that we had in education worked for us. It served us very well in the United States. Because if students dropped out, there were more factories and plants, and people needed workers. You could drop out, you could earn a good living for your family, for yourselves. If you finished high school, you got a, a little bit better of a job. You carved out that ideal middle class life. Today, students who drop out have no future. They can't sustain a life or a living for themselves. Certainly they can't sustain a family. High school graduates today who are not able to earn, to have that kind of skill that is needed in the market today are not going to be able to sustain the kind of life that, that many of us enjoy. The students that do stay in school who don't want to be there, who in the 1950s would have dropped out and done something else and made a living of it, today need more remediation, more attention than ever. So one of the things that, that I like to think about is this. We are now, with our education today, we are now making vinyl records for an iPod society. And that's going to catch up to us very soon. One of the things that's important now is technology, and we know that, and how important it is to what we do and why we do it. The one-to-one -one environment is very important to our mission. Teaching students not only to understand how technology has a role in what we do, but we also cannot forget the fact that, that, that human relations, that skill, the soft skills are vital to what we do. Because with the changes that are happening, CEOs time and again are saying, we need individuals that know the basics and the foundations, we need them to be creative, we need them to be flexible. So while we rush to do all the kinds of things that we're doing in education, we can't take our eye off the ball, and that is that human connection, that flexibility, those skills that people need to be able to not only be prepared for their first job, but their fifth or sixth job. And that's what schools are charged with doing as we move forward. I'm very fortunate that the repairman that came out and fixed my refrigerator the other day, because I'm not very skilled, the first tool he took out of his bag, a laptop. It's interesting how society is changing. And we just saw an example of, of Spanish and, and English combined because we're talking about a global market today. But here in Perrysburg, we have 42 students in our district that, are, are, that speak a different language. 14 different languages are spoken in Perrysburg schools today. Mandarin, Arabic, and Spanish are the three. So in education, what do we do? We teach French, German, and Spanish. There, take that. <laughs> imagine the challenges that we have in dealing with that. Now imagine if you're Detroit, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Austin, Texas. Next time you're driving to Columbus, Van Lue, Ohio has the same challenges. I would be remiss to say that there's another language barrier that I want to talk about that, that, that represents the changing face that we have in the students that we serve. We have some, some students who, who require some special attention, students with special needs who are on an individualized education plan. In our district, we're at almost 10% of our students have one of these individualized education plans which helps those students get that extra love and attention that they need to be successful. Now you're thinking one out of ten is a, is a large number. That is well below the state average. That is another language barrier that we continue to face with what we do. 30,000 students today in Ohio are educated in a public school that has no walls, totally online. It's the fastest growing public school in Ohio, our virtual schools. 6.1 million students, according to um, uh, the U.S. Department of Education, took at least one, I, one online class last fall. That's a 10% increase from the previous year. 
1.3 million high school students were enrolled in distance education courses in 2010. In 2004, only 300,000 had been enrolled. Those are startling, startling numbers. One of the coolest things that's happening, and U of M's involved with this, um, is embedding assessments inside video games. New York University, University of Michigan right now working on a program that will enable kids to play video games that will assess students' learning and their knowledge and report back to instructors as to what they're discovering. And I know some people are rolling their eyes saying, our oh, video games. Imagine you're a teacher today trying to teach students. It's scary because you have to compete with this. So let's stop competing. We have to stop asking for faster horses when it comes to education. The model that we have is not working in the way that it is because everyone here, we know three months of vacation is not good for kids learning. What makes 180 days of school so special if it takes 120 days to learn algebra or 220 days to learn algebra? What are we prepared to do differently to change what we know is right? Because it's not getting any easier. And we have to stop playing football with education because every new president and every new governor wants to do their thing and that continual change, the game, hurts all of us. The United States isn't the home to cool cars like it used to be. There's other competitors out there and we know in education competition is here. Lee Iacocca, who invented the Mustang, designed the Mustang on the cover of Time Magazine. One of the great things that, that he said was we've got to do something. He recognized the urgency. And like the vinyl records and like the automotive industry in the last 10 years, Education is at a crossroads right now. And the question that we have is, are we going to end up like this? As a community, what are you prepared to do differently so that school isn't some comfortable place to hang out because that's what we're used to? My son doesn't need this, doesn't want this, but I dragged him there. As a community, as a country, as a nation, when are we going to stop dragging our kids to the record store and saying, this is the way to go? Thank you.